the uh, ancient uh, cross behind his head. You will see as he's always pictured as a blonde or the sun baby. And here's the mother uh, holding her son. And here in the Vatican is a very interesting uh, a picture of, this is a sculptor in the Vatican. And it is showing Jesus' mother, the Virgin, which is Virgo, the Virgin of the Zodiac, holding her newborn son, S-U-N. And this is in the Vatican. Both baby Jesus and the grown-up Jesus are trying to show you what it's all symbolizing. It's symbolizing sun worship. Here you have the baby Jesus showing you the sun. Here are the sun worship in the Jerusalem temple, the uh, ancient Hebrews worshiping the sun. Today we have the Pope, uh, you know, all over the world carrying the sun symbol for the sun. This is not a man on a cross. This is obviously sun worship. And you will see the sun everywhere. Here's the Pope. This is what is being promoted throughout the world as Christianity, but which is in fact sun worship. Now, the ancient Egyptians pictured the, the sun had wings. And uh, we see it, and, and the sun is rolling across heaven. The sun in, in India and the Hindu worship of the sun. Now, here we have the Inca priest kneeling on an altar and, and offering up the wine in the altar to the sun god. The same you will see in Japan. You'll see in England, they're singing praises and a hymn to the rising sun, the wood carving uh, picture of the Jews and, and worshiping the sun. And here again is the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're writing about their Savior, the sun. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is spring, summer, autumn, winter. The four seasons are symbolically represented by four Gospels. This is a very important book showing that the sun in the church today, cathedrals are solar observatories. Now, of course, in, in India, the most important sun god in India was Krishna. Uh, we know that the Jesuits, when they went into India back in the 1500s, they learned very quickly the whole religion of God's Son, the light of the world in India, who was Krishna. And they came back and infiltrated those teachings and concepts into what we call Christianity. This is the work of the church borrowing the stories from the ancient world of sun gods who died on the cross. Now here is an ancient Babylonian king, and his name was Shemesh, and he was a Babylonian sun king, and you'll see the altar in front of him has the sun. But this is very important, a Babylonian king being worshipped, and his name was Shemesh. It's because in the Hebrew language, or in the Jews, Shemesh is the sun in the Jewish language. Here we have 37 of what we call sons of God from the ancient world to the modern. And they all have the same identity and the same stories that go with their lives. They were born of a virgin. They, they died on a cross. They were dead for three days and then was resurrected and came back. Their, their father was a carpenter, and they had 12, almost all of these had 12 followers or 12 apostles. They had the same story that we have in Christianity 37 times over. So it's a continuation of the same story coming out of the ancient world, and today we call it Catholicism or Christianity. The reason why these themes keep repeating themselves is because it is what is called the greatest story ever told. I think it is the greatest story ever told, that the son is born each morning and ultimately dies at night and then emerges the next morning and bring life back again, but then dies again. And so the whole story is on the subject's of the whole universe and how our skies work and how the planets work. 
I think that the idea that there are 37 major gods, sun gods, and each have the same kind of a story, where they died the, the, you know, and were resurrected, and they had a virgin birth, it seems to imply that there was some sort of an ancient, really, truly ancient culture that developed this idea and this story for the world, and therefore it has become known as the greatest story ever told, because it is, the is, in fact, the greatest story ever told, because so many ancient cultures have picked it up and applied to their own selves, their own gods, who had the same story of dying on a cross and being resurrected. There will not be any Messiah coming back for the Jews, for the Christians, or for any other religion on the earth. It's all based on ancient concepts of the prehistoric and ancient world of the sun representing life to the earth. So there won't be any Messiah coming back because there was none to start with. It's all based on the sun being the giver of life. So now that we have the, the technology today that we have, uh, where we can talk to the world uh, through the, 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 the system of technology, we can now begin to show the whole world where all of this has come from, all of these ideas and concepts and gods and sun gods have come from. We're now able to do that with the technology we have today. So, so many people today are now beginning to see that their ancient and highly venerated religions are merely part of a world continuation of a same story, the greatest story ever told. So much of the world today is ill-informed about symbols and signs that's what I do. I try and help people to understand the symbolism, the signs, the hidden indicators of where we are in the period of time and where we're going and what's coming because actually today there's so much violence and hatred among peoples and different groups because no one seems to understand we're all one people on the earth and we all have one history of the earth in the times in which we're living. And so we need to realize that all the different religions are basically telling us certain things about the ordinances of heaven. I think it will help the world and where we're going if we all start looking at symbols and emblems and educating ourselves to what these things mean. Job 38, 33, where it says, God is saying to Job, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? The Pleiades is one of the um, constellations in the heavens. And so here God is saying, can you bind the uh, chains of the Pleiades? Can you lead forth the constellations in their seasons? And then it says in 33, do you know the ordinances of heaven? The ordinances simply means a decree or a law, a directive, it's the law to understand. So God is asking Job, do you understand the laws that govern the heavens? I'm asking the same question today. First of all, in order to know the ordinances of heaven, you must know the most important part or feature of the laws of heaven. The word in the Bible is Maserat, the ordinances of heaven. If you go to Job 38, 32, you will see the word Maserat. And in the footnotes, it says the signs of the zodiac. Now, a lot of people think that the zodiac should not be connected to Christianity or the Bible at all. Actually, in point of fact, the zodiac is the basis for both Old and New Testament. When you consult Bible references like the Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias, you look up the word Maserati and will tell you it's the 12 signs of the zodiac. We are given to understand in the Bible that God created the zodiac. And that may sound strange to a lot of people because most people think of the zodiac as something evil, especially in Christianity. But no, the zodiac is the basis for 
much of our learning today, much of our symbolism today, especially in religion and politics. I mean, even the watch you wear uh, is 12 signs of the zodiac or the 12 signs that go in a circle. And that's what the word zodiac means, the 12 signs. We talk about the kingdom of God all the time, but most people don't realize what the kingdom really is. We humans put uh, different life forms into different uh, categories. We say fish are in schools and cattle are in herds. What kind of life forms do we humans say are in a kingdom if it isn't animals? Animal kingdom. The Greeks came up with uh, the idea that the zodiac was a kingdom of animals that circled the earth. And so when we say in our prayers, even in the uh, Roman system that gave us a lot of our understanding of the zodiac today, we say in our prayers, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come and let thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. We are living our lives in the zodiac. All cultures in the world recognize that the zodiac is important in their theology and their belief systems. And when you go to uh, uh, Bible bookstores or Bible seminaries, go into the large libraries, and you will begin to see that there are so many books that are written by Christian and Jewish theologians and people who study religions. Uh, Wycliffe Bible Commentary talks about to qualify as a director and judge of man's life on earth, one must be able to govern the heavenly bodies that rule the earth. Note the repeated mention of the influence of the atmospheric or astral heavens on earthly affairs. We're talking astrology. Here in the New Interpreter's Bible, It says uh, some connection between what happens in the heavens and what happens on earth is presupposed in the question that Job is being asked by God if he knows the ordinances of heaven. Being asked that question obviously means that God has a sign, uh, ordinances in heaven, and we're calling it the zodiac, Maserat. Let's go back to Genesis 1.14 while we're on this subject. And then Genesis, the first book of the Bible, the first page says, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs. Another Bible translation says, and God said, let there be light holders in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from night and let them be for signs. The word signs means things to come in Hebrew. The word for signs The word is oth, O-T-H. This is a Hebrew word which is translated in the Bible as just things to come. Well, that's what the zodiac uh, purports to do. It tells you about things to come. All Christians are aware that Jesus says to his apostles that in my father's house are many mansions. Dictators and, and kings have always felt that there's a mansion in heaven for them. Well, it's a misunderstanding. The incorrect way is to say, in my father's house are many mansions. But other translations say, in my father's house are many abodes. Abodes is where you live, and where you are is in your abode. In my father's abode are many dwelling places. Oh, now we're getting to it. Because the heavens is where God is. And if God is in heaven, The scripture says that in my father's abode are many houses, are many resting places for the sun, houses of the zodiac. Basically, it boils down to this, that both the Old and New Testament are based on astrology. The 12 signs of the zodiac is is part of the number 12 in Christianity. There were 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 breastplate stones on the high priest, then the 12 apostles. Look in the Bible, 
and you will see how many times 12 is used. It's all based on the 12 signs of the zodiac. There was no 12 tribes of Israel. Each one of those signs in the 12 tribes of Israel was an astrological indicator as to what each month represented in the ancient Jewish religion. And the ancient Jewish religion understood this. It's people today who are not studying theology do not understand that the whole of the Old and New Testament is a metaphor. Harper Collins Study Dictionary says the Lord made the constellations of Pleiades and Orion. I don't know how one could read something like this and not see that the Bible is saying God made the constellations of the Zodiac. New International Bible says He, God, is the maker of the bear and Orion and the Pleiades and the constellations of the south. So if you want to find a fault with astrology, then you're finding fault with the ideas and concepts that God has put into the heavens as laws. Many philosophers have talked about that foolish people, ignorant and foolish people, are dominated by the zodiac. They don't know that their personalities and things that happen to them are because of the stars and the moon and the, and the influence of these heavenly signs. But that wise people are guided uh, by these signs. And so I, it occurred to me that, that for thousands of years, mankind has navigated around the world on the high seas by a knowledge of the stars. And so the Bible is saying you should navigate your life by the stars. Here we have a typical publication in Christianity talking about astrology as satanic. And that's why I'm spending so much time talking about the biblical reference works, saying that no, it is created by God. It's not satanic. If you really are interested in theological and spiritual subjects, especially in relation to the Bible, you need to get the Companion Bible by Kriegel because it's an astounding work where it gives one half of the page is the, is the scripture. The other half of, the, of each page are the footnotes. And the footnotes will actually blow you away because it tells you the truth about what these symbols really mean and where they came from. In the back of the uh, Kriegel Bible, it talks about the word and where it came from in the Hebrew and what it means. And it, it basically is saying that it is uh, telling you about things to come, astrology. So here we see the four seasons, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, writing a story about their risen Savior. And what do we see them all for writing about? The Son. This is why Jesus had 12 apostles. Jesus represents God's Son. Not S-O-N, S-U-N. Jesus is a metaphor in the New Testament for the Son. And he was our risen Savior, of course. The sun rises each morning. You'll see this famous painting where there are 12 apostles. And to Jesus' right, there's the first apostle to his right, is a woman. A lot of people do not know that one of the 12 apostles of Jesus was a woman. Why? Because there is a zodiological sign called Virgo. Virgo was a virgin. That's why you have to have one woman in there to represent Virgo. The 12 apostles are the 12 signs of the zodiac. Now let's look at some of the zodiac symbols used in religious history. And we'll start with Taurus the bull. The age of Taurus was the age of agriculture when the cows and, and animals that we were now beginning to use as food, that was just one of the qualities of the age of Taurus. The age of Taurus is between 4400 and 2200 BC. 
And keep in mind that Taurus the Bull was recognized all over the world by all governments and all religions of the world. Everybody knew what it meant except us today. <laughs> so this is why you have words like holy cow. And the cow is still holy in, in, in India today. We see the Egyptians worshiping the sun between the, the horns of the bull. The sun is very important to the 12 signs of the zodiac. Most people do not realize that Taurus, being in the, in the heavens as a constellational sign, was very, very important to Judaism. Here is Taurus, the cow, the bull, and he's in heaven. You see the sun behind him, so the sun is in the age of Taurus, the bull. And, of course, we have many stories about the, the Jews worshiping the golden calf. People don't understand what that story is all about. Moses goes up to the mountain to talk with God because it is time for God to change the ordinances of heaven. And it's important here to remember that each sign of the constellation last 2,150 years. Every 2,150 years, the world changes completely. All the great religions of the world realize that. And now Moses comes down with a new beginning of a new way to worship God. A new time when God is going to be worshiped in a different way. And so Moses goes up to find out what that new way of worship that God wants people to do. And so we have the story of the golden calf. Golden, well, because the sun is golden. And calf is a bull. So we have the golden calf, or the bull, Taurus, and the sun in the age of Taurus. Today, Israel is trying to bring back the good old days of bull worship. But it's, it's impossible because Taurus is gone. We're in the age of Pisces. And they want to go back to the old days, the way we worship God in the old days with the, the golden calf. We're in Pisces, and we're at the end of Pisces. That's why the Christians talk about the end times we're living in, the last days we're living in. The last days of what? The last days of Pisces. So now we have to find the perfect bull. The Temple Institute says that you need to find a red heifer that's born in Israel, and it has to be a particular bull. The Israeli government is planning a new temple coming in Israel. And of course, it will be assumed that they're going to go back to all of the old ways of the tourist to bull. Well, so therefore they got this Jewish girl picking fleas off of a cow because they want to make sure the bull is going to be completely clean, look his best, smell good, so that they can cut his head off and bring about the dispensation of tourist to bull again. But the same bull and Christian churches also, Christians are equally as ignorant and ill-informed about their foundations of their religion. Now you'll see this one shows in the yellow square the bull. They, the, the Catholic Church in the Vatican realizes that there was a time, 2,150 years long, when God was ruling the earth through Taurus the bull. And this is where we get our idea of holy cow. Let's look at another zodiac symbol in religious history. This is very important in relation to Jewish history. Aries the Ram is the next constellation after Taurus the Bull. The Jewish system of theology understood that 2,150 years has passed. Now we move into the next age that Moses brought us into, because Moses brought us into a new dispensation. And when the Jewish people would not accept the idea at the time, we're told in the Bible that Moses became so frustrated he threw down and broke the law. So he was the first lawbreaker. 
the astrological time of Aries was from 2000 BC to 1 AD. That's a 2,150 year uh, period of time that the Jews were now to worship their God in the age of Aries, the ram. In Egypt, of course, they have the ram. You'll see the, uh, the, the sun in the age of Aries, the ram. The ram god is, is very famous all over Egypt. And Aries the ram is very important not only in Egypt, but in the Old Testament Hebrew. You'll still see it today, Aries the ram. That's why Jews blow the ram's horn. Instead of parading around with the golden calf and the bull, now today they blow the ram's horn. And so they don't realize that not only the Jews blow the ram's horn, but there are many cultures around the world that blew the ram's horn during the age of Aries the ram. That's why today we have the shofar or the ram's horn. You go back to the Vatican and you will see the same painting uh, that was with Taurus the bull. Then you go back and see it's uh, Aries the ram. Uh, since A.D. 325, we have been living in the sight of the age of Pisces. Pisces, the two fish. Christianity is the focal point of what we call Pisces. Pisces represents religion, a different kind of religion. Before it was Judaism. Now there's Christianity dominates the world. And so it has nothing to do with the Christians uh, fighting Jews or the Jews hating Christians. That has to do with the symbolism in which the world is living. And we happen to be living in the age of Pisces, the two fish. So Pisces is the age of a new religion. And if you remember that God's son Jesus, S-U-N, fed his followers in the Bible with two fish. This was in John 19, it says two fish that the, that the young boy who brought to Jesus five loaves of bread, two fish. It's a symbol of the age of Pisces, the time of Christianity to dominate the world. And then here it is again in the Vatican, you will see Pisces, the sign in the zodiac. Even in uh, Charter's Cathedral, the stained glass windows in the great church even says Pisces. The fish of the early third century appears to be the most ancient Christian inscription. And what do you see in the inscription but two fish? Pisces. Even in the Islamic religion today, uh, recognize that the zodiac symbols are from God. The Islamic world has many beautiful paintings of the 12 signs of the zodiac. So they understood that the zodiac is from God, and they have a very good understanding going back to their uh, ancient history of the symbols of the, of the zodiac. Then there is the discovery in the oldest Christian church, and this is really interesting. There was an old Christian church found, and it's called, it was re referred to as the oldest single Christian church ever found in Israel. And it was a big story at the time it came out that uh, in the area called Megiddo, Israel was going to build a wing onto an existing building. And so they had their people go out and clean out this area where they're going to build a new wing to the building. And they wanted to dig down to put the foundation. And when they dug down, they, they hit a floor. They hit a, a mosaic floor. And so they, they discovered when they started to clean the floor off, what did they find? Well, here they are when they've cleaned off the area. And what do you see on the floor? But the two fish the two fish of Pisces. And you'll see the round circle of the sun, and the little spoke going around the circle is, of course, the sunburst. 
and in the middle of the sun is the two fish of Pisces. So Israel is saying this is the oldest church ever done and ever built. Well, there's Pisces, the beginning of Christianity. Christianity today is simply the sun in the age of Pisces. There's so many articles talking about the zodiac in relation to Jesus. They don't realize Jesus is the sun, a metaphor, S-U-N. And it's talking about his 12 apostles or his 12 followers or the 12 signs of the zodiac. Jesus with his 12 apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four seasons. And this is why there are three months in each season. Christianity today is replete but saying that we are living in the last days. We're living in the end times. Of course we're living in the last days of Pisces, which means the next one coming is going to be the age of Aquarius. Aquarius is the water bearer. Very important point here that proves what we're talking about as astrology. We are now facing the next 2,150 years when the sun will officially be in the constellation of Aquarius, the water bearer. And so in the New Testament, in the book of Luke 22, the apostles are asking Jesus, now that you're going to die, where are we going to go? We are your 12 followers, but where are we going to go? And so Jesus answers them in, in the book of Luke twenty two ten, where Jesus said unto them, Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters in. It's the house of Aquarius. And as Aquarius is the water bearer. But we know that this was talking about an astrological sign. Why? Because men never carried water ever. In the ancient world, that was something that a man would never do, is to carry water. That was a woman's job, period. So why did Jesus say, look for the man with the water pitcher? That's an astrological sign. The whole of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, is a metaphor, as a symbolic story that the theologians have known for, for hundreds of years, but nobody is telling the public. That's why I think it's important to bring this out, that people need to know there's nothing wrong with the Zodiac. The Bible, both Old and New Testament, says God created it. So if you're calling down evil upon the Zodiac as a work of the devil, that's not what the scriptures say at all. And like the scripture says in the Bible, when God said to his people, do not call down evil upon something I have cleansed. When I make something, don't you call it evil. Well, this is what I'm saying that we need to keep in mind today. When you talk about astrology and the zodiac, God made that according to the scriptures. So we see the man with the water pitcher is all over the world in Christian churches. But the Christians don't know that. They don't understand what these symbols mean. The idea that most people have about the coming age of Aquarius is that it will be an age where there'll be a lot more openness to society and people will be far easier to find information and have new ideas and new concepts. What we're talking about is trying to educate the people of this world to the fact that the zodiac dominates, as we showed in the beginning, dominates the earth and our heavens. And we need to know the ordinances of heaven. And the ordinances of heaven are basically the zodiac. It rules the heavens over the earth. If we go back to Genesis 1, the very first chapter in the Bible, Genesis 1, so many people today believe and have been told, and that's why they believe it, that God made us, God made man. And they will point to the scripture that says God created Adam and Eve. 
And then they will say, see, there it is, God made man. But that's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say that God made man. In the beginning, the first chapter of Genesis says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But that's not exactly what it says in the Hebrew. This is why we are emphasizing that it says God created the heavens and the earth. But in Hebrew, the word God is El, E-L. So if we were to read this first chapter, the first verse, uh, in Hebrew, it would say, in the beginning, El created the heavens and the earth. But that's not what it says in Hebrew. It says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, not El. In the beginning of the heavens and the earth, which are now. I came across this many, many years ago, talking with a very impressive, uh, well-known rabbi. He was the one that put me onto this when I was very young, that uh, God did not create, he said, God did not create man. There's nowhere in the Old Testament, or what you call the Old Testament, where it says God created man. No, it just doesn't say that. And so I began to look at this, and he gave me all the, the ideas you know, a long time ago. So the first thing we need to look at is, as I said, the word is incorrect. God is El in Hebrew, but it's Elohim. And Elohim means the gods in the plural, more than one God. So the correct understanding of Genesis 1-1 is that in the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth. We need to define our terms first about God. And what does the word God mean in the Old Testament Hebrew? Uh, here it is uh, for you. This is God in the Hebrew is Elohim. Gods, more than one. So in uh, Genesis 1-1, it says, In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So it's more than one God. But here's the important part. We see it again. This is from another Bible translation where the word God shows up, and then it says in Hebrew, it's Elohim, which is plural, more than one. So God Elohim is plural. The word Elohim, on the top it says the word Elohim is a plural word. In Hebrew, the plural form of the noun ends in M I M O T. Elohim is a plural form. On the bottom it says it is interesting to note that even though Elohim is plural, the Hebrew dictionary still translates it God instead of gods. This is what has confused people around the world because the actual word in the Bible is gods. And this is why you will see in a lot of the reference works, they will make the distinction and show you this, the plural form of El. Now, when you go to the actual scriptures in the Hebrew Bible and the Jewish Bible, it says, Elohim, we shall make man in our image and after our likeness. But it actually says in Hebrew, Elohim said, we, W-E, meaning more than one, we will make man. Remember the Moses with the Ten Commandments, uh, where Moses receives the law and the Ten Commandments from God. And what is the first commandment? The first commandment says, I am the Lord your God, who have brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage, and you shall have no other gods before me. He didn't say there are no other gods. He just said that you will have no other gods before me. The emphasis I was told many years ago was uh, Rabbi pointed out is that God is saying to the Hebrew people with the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord, your God. You pick me. So uh, I, there's a group. What I'm saying is that picture of, say, 12 or 14 different gods, and each one is equal to, the, uh, to every other one. But if you pick one and you make a deal with that one God, then you have a relationship with that God. And so this is why uh, God says to the Hebrews, I am the Lord your God, and I shall not have any other gods before me. So 
basically it's like a young man telling his fiance. You know, there are many other young men out there like me, but I'm supposed to, you know, I, I'm going steady with you, so I don't want to have any other young men in my place. So God was a jealous God, but I, you know, it's understandable that there were many other gods. So uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He didn't say there weren't any. Now, if you read from Exodus 20, verse 3, this is just some of the ways that it is expressed in different translations. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Yes, I have no other gods. Then in the uh, Hebrew, uh, the third one down is from the, uh, from the Hebrew Bible. And it says, Thou shalt have no, uh, no Elohims uh, in my presence. So, uh, the ancient Hebrews realized that the word was uh, mentioning more than one God. But it's the Christianity today that has uh, caused that Elohim to be brought down to a singular term. And there's a lot of um, talk about this now. and It's starting to come out that, that there's a lot of question about what does Elohim mean. Well, it just means more than one deity. Judaism is said to be a first monotheistic religion. Mono meaning one, theistic meaning uh, the study of God. But in point of fact, uh, Judaism is not a monotheistic uh, religion. It is, it's, the correct term is Heno, H-E-N-O, Heno theology. Uh, Heno theology means picking one God out of a group. And so if you pick, as I said, if you pick one God out of the group, then he is your God and you are his people. It doesn't mean that that's the only God in the whole universe. No, it's just your God. Deuteronomy 11.16 says, But be careful not to let yourselves be seduced, so that you turn aside serving other gods and worshiping them. So the Jewish God, the God of the Jews, was telling them, yes, there are other gods, but don't, you know, but don't be worshiping them. First, you need to know that the people we call the ancient Hebrews were not Hebrews as such. They were, in fact, Phoenician or Canaanites, and this is where the you can trace back in the encyclopedias in the in the dictionaries about ancient Cana and the ancient area we call today Israel and Lebanon, that whole area. They were called Canaanites. Here we have another article. This one was from a Jewish magazine. It talks about it is the faith of the people of Judah and it's the developed faith of the Semitic people known as Hebrews or Israelites. It is recognized as the first religious tradition noted for its monotheism. Then it goes on to say the Hebrew tradition did not begin as monotheism. So then we find out that all the people of the Middle East were anything but monotheistic. They were, the so-called Hebrews were in that time henotheistic, meaning picking one God out of many. Here at Liberty University, they had articles about henotheism toward the assessment of a divine plurality in, in the Hebrew Bible. I'm hoping to show you that this is understood in many Bible reference works, the word henotheism, and what it actually means. The God of Israel and ancient people's growing understanding from henotheism to monotheism. We see this happening with the human race for thousands of years. Things change. You, you know, one religion begins and has a, a particular understanding of God, and give it a thousand years, and that changes, and add another thousand years, and it changes again. Until today, we have a whole new understanding that there was only one God in the universe, and he created man, which in point of fact is not true. The one article in the middle that was read, it says, um, we have previously established that the mighty ones are the sons of God, the assembly of messengers, and that Yahweh was a part of these messengers. So this is another uh, another thought being expressed that Yahweh was one of the many gods. So again, it's important when you see 
Here in the scriptures, in the Hebrew, it says, Elohim said, we shall make uh, man in our image. Now, it's interesting, too, is that when Elohim, or the gods, said, come let us make man in our image after our likeness, uh, as I was told many years ago, this was a mis- a misunderstanding of the sentence. You should not read it that God said, come let us make man in our image after our likeness, and then that would prove that God made man. No. It, the correct way to understand it is that the God says, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Not make man, but let's make him in our image, after our likeness. Well, that, of course, implies that we have been uh, tampered with, with our DNA. This is maybe a long time ago, but nonetheless, we were, we've been tampered with and we still are today. We're still, even as humans, we're still tampering with our own DNA. If you go to the encyclopedias and reference works, you will see a lot of articles on Hebrew henotheism. And I'm saying this is because it is a well-established fact that, that, that the ancient Hebrews were not a monotheistic religion. This is in the book of Psalms 82, where it says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, and he judgeth among the gods. So we see God in the, in the Hebrew tradition is one of the many gods, and he's in standing among all the other gods. Let's see how the other Bible versions say it. God takes his stand in the divine council, or Elohim God stands in the divine assembly, where there are other Elohim. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. So the point is that, that there is more than one God, and that the Hebrew God was just one of them. That's in the Old Testament, but even the Apostle Paul in the New Testament says basically the same thing. In 1 Corinthians, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, for though there may be called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there be gods many and lords many. Then in 1 Corinthians 8, 5, it says, for although there may be so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods, and there are many of them, so let's go on and move on from there. We're going back to Genesis 1.26. And this is where we, we see the scripture talks about when God is creating man or recreating man. And so it says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so there's a big difference between God making man or remaking him in their image and likeness. And what does that mean? Let's see how other Bibles put it. The Good News Bible says, then God said, and now we shall make human beings and they will be like us and they will resemble us. Here in the New Living Translation of the Bible, it says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Common English Bible says, then God said, let us make humanity in our image to resemble us. This is a far better understanding of the scripture to start with. Here's the complete Jewish Bible that says, then God said, let us make humankind in our image, in the likeness of ourselves. So it begins to open up a whole new understanding about why we appear on earth as we do, it begins to look like that we are looking today like our creator. The creators who created us are messed with our DNA and caused us to begin more and more to look like them. So that opens up the whole new can of uh, of worms also to show that there's more than one God. And so we look like the gods that created us. The reason I'm showing so many scriptures, I want you to understand, all Bibles are saying basically the same thing, that we look like the creators that created us, the Elohim, more than one. And in Genesis 3.22, and it said, The Lord God said, Behold, man has become 
one of us. Now he's become like us. He looks like us. He's acting like us. And he is very destructive like us. I have wars like us. So the Holy Bible basically says, now let us make man like us. God did not make man as you will see. The word in Hebrew for man is ish. I-S-H in Hebrew is man. But the Bible says God made Adam, A-D-M, not ish. But if you go back to the Hebrew Bible and read it, it says in this Hebrew Bible preface, it says, according to this, the Hebrew word for woman is isha, comes from the Hebrew word for man, ish. Here's another uh, reference word that said, interesting, the words for man and woman in Hebrew is identical. Man in Hebrew is pronounced ish and looks like this. But the Bible does not say God created ish. It says God created A-D-M, and then and this is important too. It doesn't say that God created Adam. The letter was A-D-M. We, uh, we humans added, the, make it to, to be uh, Adam, but it's not Adam, it's A-D-M. Here we have the Hebrew translation going back to Hebrew. It says we again, we shall make Adam, A-D-M which means a different kind of creature, Adam, A-D-M, not Adam. And he will, and we will make him in the image of us, A-D-M. Like so many other humans do, even A-D-M, Adam made human or male offspring. Look how the Bible describes it. In Genesis 5 of, of uh, Genesis 5th chapter, it says, And Adam lived 130 years, and he begat a son in his own likeness, uh, after the image, and called his son Seth. See, and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own image and likeness. So we are seeing that the man is now doing what the gods did also for us. They created us to look like them, and we now have the ability to create uh, other offspring, and we have a son who looks like us. There are many examples in the Bible that show that the gods look like us. No, we look like them. They look what they look like to start with, but we were made to look like them. As an example, a classic example is found in the story of Abraham's meeting three visitors that came to visit him. This is in Genesis 18 and 19. We're told that Abraham and Sarah were in their tent and that three men come walking up to the tent, three visitors. And when Abraham saw the three men, he went out and bowed down to them and saying, what is my Lord saying to his servant? So we're told that Abraham knew this was the Lord, God, but he looked like another man. Well, that's what the scripture says. God said we will make men to look like us in our image. In chapter 18 in Genesis, it said, The Lord appeared unto him, this was Abraham, in the plains of memory, and he sat in the tent door, and the heat of the day. And when Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, lo, there were three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran out to meet them at the front temple door and bowed himself to the ground before these three men. And here he is bowing before the three men that Abraham obviously knew was God coming with the two of his assistant angels. And so it says that uh, the Lord appeared to Abraham. And then in Genesis 18, 2, it says, And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and the three men uh, were there. And so we're told that Abraham then asked the three men to stay for something to eat, to have lunch with him, and then they could go on. And the Lord said, No, he was. they were on their way to take care of some business, and they didn't have time. And the scripture says that uh, that Abraham went out and insisted that they stay for just a short time to have lunch. And God then said to Abraham, all right, then do that, but make it quick because we're in a hurry. And so the scripture goes on to say that Abraham's wife, Sarah, fixed uh, a lunch for the three men. 
And now we are told that Abraham went out and sat under the tree with the three men as they had lunch. Now, after eating, two of the three men got up to be on their way, while the third man stayed a bit longer to talk with Abraham. So now we got a guy sitting under the tree talking with Abraham. He just had lunch. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. So we're told that the men that left, they were on their way to somewhere, so Abraham quickly got up and escorted them a short distance on their way. Well, they were on their way to Sodom. And it says, and then in Genesis 19, the next chapter, the two men that were having lunch with Abraham, and then they got up and walked towards Sodom. That's in chapter 18. But in chapter 19, it goes on to say, and there came two angels to Sodom and at evening time. And Lot sat at the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing these two angels, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself uh, with his face to the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, and I pray you to come and, and be in my home if you're going to be here. And the men said, Again, we're interchanging angels and men. And so the men said to Lot, no, uh, we won't, we won't stay at your home. We will just stay in the city and we'll be all right. But it keeps interchanging men with angels. Okay. So the point in this, according to the Bible, the word for God is Elohim and means the gods, plural, more than one. And they make us to look in their image and their likeness. We look like them, so that's why your male offspring looks human like you. So here's Abraham meeting the three men with Sarah, uh, offering them to stay for lunch. Then we see this is a, a portrayed in many paintings in the Bible of the three men, which are actually three angels. It implies also that the third man was actually the Almighty God because it's capitalized in the Bible. So this is the Almighty God who looks like a man and stays and has, has lunch with uh, Abraham. So this is why the Christian New Testament has the Apostle Paul saying in the Bible, he says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware meaning that if you see someone, uh, another man, be careful because it might not be, in fact, another man. It may be an angel who you look like, but he looks like what he looks like to start with, and you were made into looking his image. You were made to look like him. So just be careful when you're talking to other people. Show respect because you never know who you're talking to. Here again in, in the book of Hebrews, Chapter 2, talking, this is uh, Apostle Paul again. And it says, remember to welcome strangers in your homes. There were some who did that and welcomed angels without knowing it. Very interesting that we're beginning to see God didn't make a man. God remade man. He began to change, and this is why the scripture says it that way. Come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So today, what I'm saying is that we look like the gods who created us. And so this is why Abraham can go out and feed the, feed the three men, and then you find out, no, those are the angels that went into Sodom. All of this is actually very important in understanding theology and religion from the Bible's standpoint. This is something that most people have never heard before, that we look like the gods who created us, gods more than one. So when we go back to Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens. No, it wasn't God. It was plural, Elohim. And Elohim, plural, gods, comes, we give the term henotheistic, meaning more than one God. And it is also inter interesting to understand that in Islam, in the Quran, everywhere God is talking to man, 
It's we. You look it up in the Quran, you will see everywhere that God is talking to his people, he keeps saying we. We would did this. We are going to do that. We had you do this. We, we created you. And it actually says that in the Quran. We created you. So indeed, there are many different gods 